Uh, brought to you by Phoenix Rehabilitation and Nursing Center and the Care Rights Centers Network. Great to have you all here. As, as most of you know, Phoenix uh, in Fort Greene is, is really a staple of downtown Brooklyn, lower Manhattan communities too. Provides really unprecedented levels of rehabilitation to, uh, to patients from across the tri-state area, not just New York City. Uh, tonight we have two really incredible speakers, uh, uh, both of whom have really amazing stories, overcame what, what many people would see as nightmarish circumstances uh, to not only have a quote unquote normal life, but to do things that, that so many of us could only dream of doing. Please welcome Todd Schaffhauser and Dennis Older. Thank you. Thank you. So you two, have your stories have been sort of intertwined for the past 30 years or so, uh, but I want to talk a little about how you came to this point where you are today. Uh, uh, Todd, we'll start with you because this started for you at the age of 15. T tell us what happened to you when you were a teenager. Well, it was, um, I was diagnosed with bone cancer at the age of 15. Um, it was just a kind of a freak accident how it happened. I was bowling with my friends and uh, my leg gave way and I had nothing that was really, you know, no symptoms beforehand. And I wound up falling, and I, the way I fell, I fell into the gutter, and I actually shattered my left wrist. So I had to go see a specialist. And uh, the guy I went to go see, it was summertime, I was wearing shorts. He looked down at my legs, and he looked at my left leg, and he's like, what's going on there? And he sent me for an x-ray, and then he had just started his own practice and was there for one week. He had just left Sloan Kettering. So it was just, you know, an amazing time. The next morning, I was going into Sloan Kettering. I was there, and then I was getting more, more uh, x-rays and, and MRIs and stuff like that. And what went through your mind when you were told that you were going to have to lose the leg? You know, I, I did not know what was going to happen next. I was really scared, really just, you know, in a state of shock, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, never met anybody going through this kind of a situation. Uh, but I saw my family, especially my mother at the time, and just how devastated she was by it. So I knew I had to really kind of pull together as best as I could to try to make it as, as best as it could be for her. So, but it was a very tough, difficult time. And soon thereafter, you did meet somebody else who was going through the same situation, and, and that was Dennis. Dennis, you were in your, your early 20s, um, and early tell 20s. us tell us yeah. what happened to you. Uh, I got out, I went to a hockey game on Long Island, uh, and after the hockey game was over, we went to leave, and it was pouring down rain, and the car I was in stalled, and um, couldn't get it started, went to push it off to the side of the road, and got hit from behind. Uh, Went through a whole bunch of surgeries and uh, ultimately the amputation of my right leg below the knee, which was also just three weeks away from signing a contract to play soccer professionally. So it was um, at 24, you know, your whole life and your dream about being a professional athlete just taken away like that. It was, uh, it was a really difficult time for a, for a period of time until I was lucky enough that a friend of mine, because I, I isolated myself like most amputees do, you know, you don't have anything to judge what's going on in your life. You know, you feel very isolated, especially for the family members. And then I wound up, um, a good friend of mine dragged me out of the house because there was the Paralympics were going on on Long Island uh, in 1984. At that time, it was called the International Games for the Disabled. And I went out reluctantly. I was on crutches. I didn't have an artificial leg yet. And uh, I saw a guy sprint around the track, and as they came by me, I realized that they were exactly the same disability I was. Now, we're talking the 80s. So to even think that I was going to ever walk again was not even on the radar screen because all I ever saw growing up were people in wheelchairs missing legs. And why is that? Because most amputees hide their disability back then. You know, you wear long pants even during the summertime. So to be able to see that, when they came past me and I realized they were the exact same disability that I was, it just immediately changed my life. And Todd talks about this all the time and seeing is believing. And the things that we do today with the amputees that we care about and love and how we make a difference in people's lives is steadfast in what we do. So with that, I uh, went back. I realized one day I'd walk, one day I'd run, one day I'd be a competitive athlete again. And then um, I got lucky enough to meet Todd uh, in 86. Uh, grew up one town over from me. I didn't even know at that time, and um, uh, I was looking for something. There was no rehab that I went through, and the Achilles Track Club, uh, Dick Trom, uh, put me in touch with someone at a hospital for special surgery where he was involved in a research study. And um, 
I got a phone call from this woman. She said, can you pick this kid up? There's an event going on on Long Island, I mean, in Nashville, Tennessee, which is the amputee national championship. So I was like, Long Island's a pretty Long Island. And then uh, as it turned out, my dad was taking me to the airport, and he grew up, we grew up one town away from each other. So that's how we met. That was 1986, and um, we've been together ever since. And at that time, there were... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> There's anything wrong with that. You right. know what I'm saying? <laughs> we started training together, and uh, we were very, very fortunate to have the kind of support system in place that allowed us to achieve our dreams and our goals. And then in 1988, in Seoul, Korea, is when we became the fastest leg empty sprinters in the world. And at that time, there was nothing like what you have created over the past 30 years. No. So, so how were you able to, to go from not thinking you'd ever be able to be a runner to being the fastest above the knee amputee and the fastest below the knee amputee in the world? Yeah, there was nothing to go by. You know, there was no videos to watch, no therapist to even go to to say, hey, can you teach me? It was all trial and error. So it was trying to really just learn through experience. Um, and, you know, the Paralympics, I was real lucky. My therapist really took the next step with me to try to not just be there for me through therapy, but also think about going beyond. And that's something that, you know, for therapists, that's something special that they have inside. But he knew when my rehab was ending that I needed to do something else. So I remember the last day I, I went to therapy. I was real lucky I went, you know, hospital for special surgery for therapy. I was part of a six month rehab program and I saw my therapist five days a week for an hour, which is incredible. But this again was the 80s, so it was kind of a little bit of the norm. Um, but I remember after that six month, the last day was a Friday, 4.30 to 5.30 was my slot. I went in at 4.30 and I love David, my therapist. He was a great friend. But after six months of being with them, I was ready to say goodbye. <laughs> You know, six months <laughs> is enough, and I'm glad, you know, every, thank you for everything you did for me, but it's over. And I remember that last day, I went in for therapy, and I, I was leaving, and I said, David, this is awesome. Um, thank you for everything you've done for me. Gave him a big handshake, but I'm never going to see you again. And then he goes, well, I just so happen to have this piece of paper in the back of my pocket. Uh, why don't you take a look? And he, what he did is that he signed me up for that national championship games down in Tennessee. And then he said, I'm not gonna be a therapist anymore. I'm gonna be your track coach. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> so I, I can't think of many things more, more gratifying than be able to teach somebody who's gone through something so traumatic, something that's caused so much pain, uh, to be able to walk again, to be able to run. Tell me about the, the walking and running school that, that you created. How many people has it helped? How long has it been around? Yeah, we've been very, very lucky, very fortunate. It started out as running clinics. That's the way our whole career started. You know, <clears throat> had I signed that contract, as I mentioned, to play soccer professionally, my career would have lasted only one year. The entire league folded. It was defunct. And um, we were very blessed that in 1988, after we set our world records, I mean, an above the knee amputee to run 100 meters in 14 seconds on an above knee prosthesis was out of control back in that day. My 100 meter time, 11.7, less than two seconds behind the fastest human being on the planet, Carl Lewis. 1 1,000 and Dennis Hole across the finish line. I think people would be amazed to I know, hear everybody's that. Supposed that, to that, that yeah, supposed so to that somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Self proclaimed narcissist that I am. No, but, and so. What we saw very early on was that when doing these running clinics, after we signed, after we competed and, and, and set these world records the following year, both Todd and I, for over a decade, we were professional amputee sprinters. We signed on with the manufacturers and traveled all over the world teaching amputees to run. But what we saw, which would pain us in doing this, was we were seeing so many of the demographics that we work with today and what we do with CareRight at our facilities is the older population were coming out to our running clinics, diabetic vascular patients, and that's where we needed to, to do something to make sure we keep these legs on folks and to support them on a long-term basis. And that's when we came up with the concept of the amputee walking schools. What's very gratifying now is we've never had this kind of opportunity because it's always been an outpatient program that we did. We never had the opportunity to bring it to a skill level and be able to help our folks immediately as they came in because you have so many people that 
they have no idea, you know, what their life is going to be like. They, 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 they are so isolated, and especially for the family members. So what we've created with CareRight and what we do as a group now is we have an entire protocol which is specializing in amputee rehab, which it's three phases of what we do. There's the mentoring program, which Todd and I speak with every single patient that comes through our facilities. We then, the therapists here who are going to go through our programming as far as the training techniques, all of our therapists at all our facilities have gone through three hours of training with us um, in all our techniques. And then we have the Amputee Walking School, which is a program that is so near and dear to our heart so that we can open it up to the community and allow people to come in who are amputees from outside to experience a support group mechanism that's in place. So what we've created is, is I'm, I'm living a dream right now. I really am to be able to help so many people uh, in so many different states all over where our facilities are. It's really a very special thing we have going on. And how many now, 20,000 people you estimate over, are, are well living their 20, own dreams well because, 20, of, because of yeah. starting with being able to meet you and getting inspired by your own stories and then taking it from there. Yeah, I mean... Th it's a very different approach <clears throat> because, you know, we always I would talk about this at all the programs is that, you know, when you get a chance to see what life will be like six months down the road in a very positive way, it, it changes your life. So for those amputees or those that are contemplating amputation at our facilities or at the hospital, um, they get a chance to see that life is not over and that it's not just, you know, us coming in to talk to them, but they get a chance to see their peers. Mr. Jones meets Mr. Jones, both the same age, the same reason for amputation, and they can see that life is going to go on. They got to see it. You can talk about it all the time. You can say a thousand words, a million words to somebody. It might not make a difference. That one little vision, that two second clip, will change your life. And that's yeah. what we try to provide with the program. You know, we, um, we also. A big part of what we do is we see pa patients bedside, but you know a lot of times we can't be bedside because we travel a lot. In addition to the programs that we run with CareRight, we, we're also in 20 other, 24 other cities in 12 states, uh, working with major institutions doing the program, still on an outpatient program with major hospitals. So we travel quite a bit. And in your packets, guys, you have that flyer, the flyer of Todd and I. That is a very important document because it basically. Quina, who works at Phoenix, who's our liaison, she's us. A lot prettier than Todd and I, but she's <laughs> us. And so when she goes into a hospital, if a case manager calls and says, hey, Quina, we have someone who just had an amputation. Do you think maybe you can have the guys come in and talk to them? If we're in town, we always do that. But if we're not, we're on the phone all the time, speaking with families, describing the program. So Quina has the ability to be able to go in. She articulates our program, articulates people's lives that have been changed. Oldest person we actually work with, 101 and a half. How about that? AK one side, BK the other side. And this is a woman who lost her leg when she was 90, when right? she was 90. She got transferred to a facility, and it was our health care system that said, you know, you, you're not a candidate. But she had that will within her. And we just lost Kay at 106 not too long ago. So when you can go into a hospital room and you have a 75-year-old gentleman or woman that looks at you and says, I'm 75, how much more time do I have? I don't want to have the amputation. You know, and they're so sick at that point because of the infection and everything else. And when you can tell that story and they can experience, you know, what we're doing, it changes their life. And you know what happens? They have the amputation, and then we all see it. You guys see it. You know, two, two months later, you know, the infection's cleared. They, they heal up. They're on a leg. You know what everybody says all the time? I wish I would have done this two years ago. You have people that are non-healing wounds on their feet all the time, but they just don't know. They just don't see that light at the end of the tunnel. So our walking school over the last 28 years, we'll be 29 years doing this program, has been so incredible from teaching people to run. We did such a good job, folks, of teaching people to run. In 1996, in Atlanta, Georgia, our last Paralympics, every single person in his race from someplace around the world we had taught to run, with the exception of one guy. And it was funny, because he got beat by two of them. <laughs> it was great. I was laughing so hard. So now you know what, what these gentlemen are about, and you already know you have so much uh, to learn from them tonight. So I'd like to turn it over to Todd now to, to take you through his portion of the program. Todd. Awesome. Awesome, Thank awesome. You. Does anyone have any questions at all on, on what we're doing as a group, as far as concepts and how great 
the program is for changing lives. No, I know you guys are going to love this. This is. If you awesome. think of any questions, we'll have a, a Q and A at the end as well. So, uh, so, so we can take your questions then too. All right, but if you have questions as we go along, feel free to just ask us. Just shout it out for free flowing guys. No. All right, so we, with the program, just, just a little bit more of the, my background. Um, and this here is uh, the Rays from Seoul, Korea. I, I like to show this Rays because this is truly uh, history. When, you know, the Paralympics, they came about was 1960 in Rome. But amputees did not start to compete until 1976. So it took a long time to have the first competitions for amputees. And everything that was involved was all wheelchair events. Um, it took until 1988 to have enough above the amputees to even field a race. You had to have three countries to have a sanctioned race. So this is the first ever race. It was not, was not a world record at the time. It was five guys from around the world. I was really lucky to get a copy of this race because I had never seen it before. Again, you're talking 1988. So, you know, we didn't have, you know, CBS there filming, you know, it was something that was still at the very infancy stage. So out of the blue, like 10 years ago, I'm at my house, I got home from work and there's this brown manila envelope and it's just addressed to me. It's got no return address and it feels kind of like, what is this? And I open it up and it's a little sticky note on a VHS tape and it says, you might want to see this. Now, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but <laughs> what do you do? Now, I look at it, and I'm like, what could this be? And you flash back to everything in your life. My wife is standing next to me, and she's like, oh, we better take a look. <laughs> so I don't have a VCR, so we got to go find a VCR. You know how hard that is 10 years ago to find a VCR? We find one, I pop it in, and it's this race. And it was like, you know, for me, it was just like, you know, seeing this for the first time, you know, it was like 20 years later almost. But everybody in the race... Oh, please play. Oh, not going to play. You can see it on the website. But everybody in the race was running a hop-skip style run. I was taught to run step over step. So that was a big difference for the time. Uh, no one had ever seen that before. You know, we had practiced that. I had practiced that because whenever I tried to run a hop-skip, I was never competitive. I just wasn't fast. So my therapist is like, well, let's try something different. Let's think outside the box, which is awesome. Well, David, he was always trying to think different of the training that we would do and everything that we would do. So he said, let's try it this way. It took a lot longer to, to really perfect, but the outcome was just incredible. So that's this race. I won. <laughs> Moving on, you know, the exercises that kind of came about from these programs um, happened all from track and field. We took all the, all the things we did in track and field, we broke it down to a basic, basic level, and then started to introduce it into the program. And as patients and, patients and our, our friends would come to the program, they would be adapted even more. You know, if your 15-year-old kid comes to the program, they're going to do the exercises a little bit differently than Mr. Jones who's 75. You just adapt to who comes through the program. And that's what's been great about this the experience over the last 28 years of doing the program. Every time we do a walk-in school, it's always different because the people that come are different. They got different things they're going through and it's always a different experience. So I always say, you know, if you haven't been to a program, you never know what's going to happen when you come to the program. So we started to do the program in 1989 in these different formats, full day clinics, started to introduce continuing education, but it's always been about the patients. And, and we're, we are living a dream right now because the one thing that's been missing with this program over the last 27 and a half years before we started working with CareRight is the ability to start the program from the beginning, which is the point of amputation. The community programs were great. We did an awesome job. However, if you have an amputation tomorrow, you're not going to see us at the community program until 150 days from now. So this is something that's really changed. It's a game changer for us and for our rehab for our amputee population.
All the things that we, we do with the program is all about strength training. You got to strengthen that person, try to help them so they don't really lose strength, but that's difficult because they're very deconditioned. They've been trying to possibly save their limb for a year before they even have the amputation. So these are all strength training exercises that we go through. If I can strengthen your hip, if I can strengthen your residual limb, you're going to control the prosthesis a lot better. So the earlier that we can start to introduce that, the better the outcome is going to be. Prosthetic control, what I mean by that is that no matter what knee mechanism you have as an above knee amputee, whether it's a microprocessor knee, a hydraulic knee, whatever it is, you got to learn to control it. It's got to become second nature. And second nature, the one thing I've learned the last 28 years doing this program, second nature takes a lot of repetitions to happen. We don't get enough time in rehab to reach second nature. It has to happen on the community level. Mr. Jones has to go home and want to keep progressing. So that's a difficult battle sometimes, especially if that person puts up a wall and you got to fight through that wall just to get basic things done. Cardio conditioning. Therapists always are like, what do you, what do you mean by that? I, we just did it this past week in Indiana. We had this awesome week uh, working with patients in Indiana. I want to get Mr. Jones on the treadmill for the first time. When he's looking at the treadmill and he thinks, I'm never going to get on that machine, that should be the goal, if it's at all possible. Even getting him on there, holding on to the handrails for dear life at 0.5 miles per hour, that should be the goal, to try to do the maximum of what we can. If it can't be done in the initial rehab, Got to be done on a community level. Even if he only does it for that one time at the walk-in school, that's going to change his life, knowing that, one, he can do it, but also seeing just the benefits he gets out of it. And then the running, you know, running is something that we, we do running clinics all the time with patients that come, those that graduate from the walking school and want to learn to run. It's, they, we're going to try and do that. But that's not the true goal of the program. The goal is to try to get your, your, our everyday heroes to get them to be the best they can on their prosthesis uh, from the very beginning. We're going to talk about the different muscle groups. We're going to really talk about the extensor muscles. That's where we have a lot of weakness. The, we see a lot of times that many amputees, because they have weak extensor muscles, they have just weak, you know, ability to control their prosthesis. They sometimes like to shift everything to their sound side. They like to maybe have their knee bent underneath them because they're shifting their weight. You know, if you ever had someone that you're kind of talking in conversation and then they buckle their knee underneath them because they're just not aware, things haven't become second nature just yet. So that's what we're trying to work towards and get to those goals. And that's all about strengthening the overall hip. We focus on those extensor muscles. And we try to really just go through the different exercises and, and really reinforce what they're trying to do. I mean, the starting point for these exercises are three sets of five. If you get that far, you know, Mr. Jones to get three sets of five is sometimes not going to even happen. So we have a, a really small starting point, but we reach for high goals. Five sets of 25 are what, we looking, what we're looking for. Oh, need a uh, need a cord. <laughs> Five sets of twenty-five. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. And when you're doing that with somebody, you know. Again, it takes a long time to get to that point. They, they go in through their rehab, they get their home care, they hopefully go for outpatient rehab, they come back to the walking school, and then they keep progressing from there. So those goals that we're trying to set with somebody from the very beginning are very small, but again, we have really high goals. One of the exercises that we work on next we call heel strikes. And a heel strike exercise is, again, work on, on the extensor muscles, having that person learn to bring the prosthesis down to the ground. We see a lot when somebody has their walker and they come to the walking school and they have a similar kind of gait that's kind of like this. They take the steps and they really kick the prosthesis out and then they drop it on the ground. And we see it all the time. The person kicks that leg out, 
the leg goes out in full extension, the heel is in the air, and they have like a foot of clearance from where the heel is in the air until it comes back down to the floor. And you go and you check their extension strength, it's either non-existent or they're just not used to using it. You know, they're so used to just pushing forward, using those hip flexors, because they do that all the time, never thought about bringing a leg down to the ground. So what we do is this heel strike exercise right inside the parallel bars where we simply just put the prosthesis behind us and all we want them to do is basically take one step. So they push on the front wall of the socket to bend the knee, they quickly pull to the back to strike the heel right back down to the ground. So what it is is learning a cadence, the cadence inside the socket to learn all these different techniques of what we're going to do. So starting position again, inside those parallel bars they're holding on and it's a, a movement just like this. And when they bring the prosthesis down to the ground, they have to, again, use the extensor muscles. So it's not coming out and just dropping a leg down to the ground. You have to come through and bring the leg down to the ground. And bring the leg down to the ground is a big word because bring it means control. Drop it means the leg's gonna come down wherever it wants. When someone is helping you to spot, all they're gonna simply do as the spotters Again, you're inside parallel bars. If someone comes through and they float that leg, you're gonna be holding on. They come through, they hit your hand. You kind of like draw a line across from the other knee. I come through, I hit your hand. You're gonna push backwards. Again, assisting the extensor muscles to help them to learn the cadence of what we wanna do. Don't hit my valve. <laughs> Eject them out of his leg. Eject somebody out of their leg. That happened once. You know, in, um, in doing this um, exercise, am I on the speaker here right now? In doing the exercise, what we try to get through to our folks um, when working with especially your new amputees is we don't really talk about muscle groups. We, you know, somebody who's 80 years old, they don't care where their hamstrings are, right? But what we want them to understand is what do they need to do inside that socket in order to achieve these different movements. For above knee amputees, pushing and pulling inside that socket is really incredibly important, but everybody does this all the time. They push very aggressively on that front wall, and they just kick that leg out and let it swing out, and then it drops down to the ground. And a lot of that, you know, you see that happening all the time because they've never had to really utilize their extensor muscles before. Why? Because with these computerized legs and these hydraulic knees, we've built in so much stability, so much stance control in that leg that the amputee does, doesn't even have to think about using those extensor muscles. Um, and so what winds up happening is they'll go to kick that leg out, and then it kicks out, it drops down to the ground. What happens at heel strike? Knee locks, creating this very safe moment, right? Then they roll over into mid stance, they go to toe off, and what do they do again? They just kick the leg out. What haven't they consciously thought to do, because they never had to, is what? Bring the leg down, using those extensor muscles. And if we don't use a muscle group, what's gonna happen, guys? Non-existent atrophy, right? Just so, you know, with this leg, this gentleman here, Lee, he's in a swing phase. These aren't gonna work, right? No. You guys can see all this on our website. We'll give you all the information to, to the visuals of it. But he's in a swing phase hydraulic knee only. When we taught him to run, Lee, Lee was uh, a Marine, and he came to us on a temporary prosthesis. The leg was a swing phase hydraulic knee only. He had no stance control on that leg at all. So as he walked, and if that leg hit and that knee began to buckle, how would he stop himself from buckling and falling? It was by using those extensor muscles, right? Because, and the problem is that because most amputees never have to use those extensor muscles, they become weak and atrophied. So when doing all these exercises, when we can, we take out the stance control. Because I want them to understand what they need to do to stabilize that knee. Because there isn't a leg in the world, guys. There isn't a leg in the world that if you're walking and you stub your toe like this, right, and that knee begins to buckle, and your body mass and weight is out here, guess what? You're going down. There isn't a leg in the world that's going to stop you from falling. The only thing that's going to stop you at that point is you've got to think very quickly on your feet, take a quick hop off this side, and then inside that socket, in a rhythm like this, inside that socket, you've got to push and pull to get the leg underneath you to stop you from falling. 99% of the amputees have no clue how to do that. Why? Because in your environment, you can't get that aggressive with them, and with our healthcare system, it's not allowing us to get to that point to be able to really help these folks. 
That's why we developed the amputee walking school. That's why what we do at our facility all the time is we're teaching these techniques. Oddly enough, that is the first step of learning how to run because you've got to have flight stage. You've got to be in the air, push off, push and pull, get the leg down to the ground. A lot of this would make a lot more sense. I hope it's starting to make some sense, but when you see the videos, if you go to our website, you'll really clearly understand everything we're talking about through the videos. So we also ask the person to transfer their weight when they do the exercise, but it doesn't happen in the beginning. So if you as a spotter, you come on, come on over. That's your cue, spotter. Come on over. So you come on through, you do the heel strike, and again, you're going to help them by doing the uh, exercise to get the leg down. But also when they come on down, you want to try to pick up their prosthesis and you want to try to bend their knee. So when you come on through, you try to pick up the leg. And what you're going to see happen is that the person's you're going to be able to lift up their leg like it's light as a feather. And, and when you do that for the first time with anybody, make sure you watch their face because it's the funniest thing because you look up at them and they're like, they look at you like you're Hercules. Like, how can you pick up my leg? I'm shifting all my weight. But, but they're not. They think they are. So you try to pick up their leg and you try to bend their knee. You should not be able to do both. The prosthesis should be cemented to the floor using those extensor muscles pushing down. Um, when someone is doing that from the very beginning, again, three sets of five. If we get that far, that's what we're trying to work towards. Five sets of 25, some in advance. I want to go back to this exercise we do is a, a leg swing. Now the leg swing exercise basically is a pendulum swing underneath us to try to swing the prosthesis. Uh, you might have to stand on a little step when we do this, but you're trying to teach is range of motion out of the knee, range of motion out of the hip. Now Lee, because he was so strong, again, 25 years old, a Marine, when he would do this exercise, he was so powerful that he would kick the leg and it would just be incredible strength. Mr. Jones is 75, you're getting just a small range of motion. But it's a very important exercise if you can do it. Sometimes the prosthesis, the knee does not allow you to do it. But if you can, it teaches a lot. It teaches, again, range of motion out of the knee, range of motion out of the hip, strengthening the hip. Like, it's an unbelievable strengthening exercise, but teaching that kind of control. When someone's doing this, though, for the first time, you have to make sure that the prosthesis is fitting properly, okay? Because we always joke about, and therapists ask, is what does this kind of, what does this exercise feel like? Well, it kind of feels like you swing your leg and you want to kick your leg off. That's what it kind of feels like. But we hope that's not going to happen. But one time it did. And this lady came in. She was 76 years old. I was spotting her, and she did two leg swings. On the second swing, she kicked her leg off, and it flew off like a rocket. It, it twisted in the air. I was spotting her, and she just yelled, and she said, my leg. And I looked at her, and I said, it's over there. And, and the leg just fell to the floor. It was a tile floor, so it skid on the floor even more. All the therapists that were there, you all jumped up to go grab the leg. So I had to yell and I had to say, don't touch that leg. That's a new world record. And it was. It was 13 feet, 8 inches away. The old world record was by this 16-year-old kid in Australia, like 10 years before that. He did 8 feet 6, right? Still the world record today she's got. But when she walked in that day, you kind of knew something like that was going to happen. Because when she walked in that day, she did not walk like the leg was part of her. She did not feel like the leg was part of her. And so you kind of knew something like that was going to happen. But that is still, still a record today. So we don't do this exercise as much anymore. <laughs> but if you can do it, it's a great exercise to do. Moving on from heel strikes, we try now to just, just really just make it a little bit more difficult. And we do that by adding what we call grid work. And the grid work exercise is something where it's a targeting exercise. You take these big pieces of tape, you want to put them inside the parallel bars, and you basically is creating these targets that the person has to not just step on, they have to target and strike to. 
So they're going to do the heel strike exercise, but now you're going to call out these numbers in and out of order as we go through the grid trying to hit each mark that's called out. Look, we got a grid right there. Go do it. <laughs> we got four marks. Trust me, I'm going to hit all of them. So you come on through and you hit each of the marks, and it's simply coming on through, but not just landing on it. Again, shifting the weight, targeting, targeting it. You as a spotter, you're going to try to pick up their leg. You're going to try to bend their knee, everything that we did before. So we're working from one thing, trying to add something else and make it a little bit more difficult. We do this exercise because a lot of times uh, people ask about going to the store. You know, when I go to the store and I walk down the aisle, you told me to take the shopping cart and walk down the aisle, and I did that, but you didn't tell me people were going to be walking my way. Because as a brand new amputee, six months out, even a year out, if, an, if someone's walking your way, what do we do? We sometimes we stop dead in our tracks. We wait for the crowd to go by. We don't just blend on in. If you want to blend on into the crowd without stopping, you got to learn how to target. You got to learn how to take different lead steps, learn how to target just to be able to step in, into the direction you need to go. So this exercise we do, this right here and this picture is Mario from our program on Long Island. He's a bilateral above the amputee and, and doing this program, doing this exercise for him for the first time is very difficult. I mean, he's trying to master it with both sides. Um, the one thing too is that you see the toes are sticking up in the air. We want him to transfer his weight a little bit more. So we see that, but that's not the initial goal of the exercise. The goal is for us to target and strengthen the hip. We'll work on the weight shift, more of that, later on as he starts to really trust his legs underneath him. You know, this exercise, though, folks, of all the exercises that we talk about for above knee amputees tonight, if there's only one to remember, let it be this one. This, this targeting exercise, because if you look at everything, the way that grid is set up, if you look at everything that's going on inside this exercise, without the amputee even knowing about it, it's a strength training tool, right? So every time he drills those marks, he comes out, he fires those extensor muscles. You open the grid up, he's going to work his abductor muscles. He goes across the grid, he's going to work his adductor muscles. So he's working every aspect of his hip inside that grid. What else is it good for? What is the most difficult thing to get us to do as amputees? Weight shift. Weight shift. They don't want to do it, right? So weight shifting, they're doing it without even realizing it. They're hitting those marks and they're shifting their weight. So every time they do it, they're going to shift their weight. Weight shifting, great exercise. What else is it good for? Proprioception. Knowing where your leg is in space. He's not getting lucky. He's not just throwing that leg out and it's dropping down wherever it wants to go. He is in total control of that leg. So it's a great exercise for weight shifting. And the last thing, and I say this all the time, what's most important about that exercise is he's learning how that hydraulic knee functions. He's learning how it works. He's learning how that hydraulic fluid is reacting so that that knee becomes what it's supposed to be, which is his knee. And why do I say that, guys? Because it does, never fails. Well, we've been doing this program for so long. We have, you know, 15, 20, 30 amputees come out, you'll have some people, it drives us crazy, you'll have some people on a computerized knee like Todd has, a $160,000 leg, right? They come walking into our program and they walk in like this. Circumducting that leg and never bending the knee, ever. And they've had the leg for five years. That's how long these legs have been around. And you think about that, whose fault is that? It's a trick question, it's not your fault. It's our healthcare system. Our healthcare system doesn't allow us the ability to really learn how to master these legs. That's why we develop this protocol and program. You learn how to use these. This is what we do at the walking schools. It's, 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 it's mind-blowing. It really is. Any questions so far on that? Next thing we do, we call baby steps. The baby steps exercise is a... Uh, for teaching someone to take very small steps. But that's not how I, we actually started this. We started this exercise for because of vaulting. You know, back 27 years ago when we were traveling all over the world doing this program, we had a lot of people that would come to the, the walking school and they would kind of have a gait similar to this where they would hike up on their sound side, bring the prosthesis through secondary, and they would, you know, not even bend their knee sometimes. So we thought about is what's a good exercise to help that. And I, I just thought about all the things that we did in rehab. And for track and field, 
we do a lot of stuff, taking small steps sometimes, um, all the different drills, and we started to add this as an exercise. So basically what you're doing is having that person take very small steps inside the parallel bars. It's basically doing that heel strike exercise, but now just taking that small step. The goal in the exercise is to take as many steps from beginning distance to end. So when you start on one side of those parallel bars and you get to the end, our goal of what we're looking for is 12 steps. The goal of what people actually do is three steps. Mr. Jones is 75 years old, takes three steps. To get them to do more, you got to do a little bit of cueing, which I'll show you. What you're trying to do is to take a very, very, very small step. It's really up and down, up and down. So now inside the socket, the cadence is really, really quick. You know, you push and pull, push and pull to be able to control taking that small step. You know, we love doing this exercise, especially when we get like 15 year old kids come in because, you know, I'll say that's a very difficult exercise to do and they'll go, oh no it's not, that's easy. <laughs> if you're in parallel bars and you're pushing and pulling inside that socket in the rhythm that we described where it's front wall, back wall, they find out in a New York minute where those extensor muscles are because they just cramp right up. This is an excellent exercise for helping folks cure of vaulting. And if you think about why do people vault, it all comes back to not having the ability to spend that much time with you guys. So they leave you after they get their rehab, they go back home, they're learning how to use this leg, then all of a sudden they stub their toe, they fall down, they jump up, and then they go, that ain't never going to happen again. <laughs> and that's what winds up happening. I got a great story for you. Want to hear a funny story? It's like, who says, it's like, who says no, right? <laughs> Todd and I, we, um, th this it absolutely cures vaulting. It's, it's amazing. We went down to Australia, uh, to Melbourne, and we had to do uh, Melbourne, Sydney, a couple other cities. And so this is when we were back in the day of doing our running clinics. So we go down to Melbourne, and um, early in the morning, it's 24 hours to get there. First thing in the morning, I'm watching people as they come in. Because we've been given a gift that, I can tell by the faces of the people that walk in who need our help, who needs a little bit of help, and who are in turmoil. So I always, as they're coming into the program, I always scan that so that I can direct positive information in the direction I need to, to for those people who are hurting. So this one guy walks in, he's 6'6", six, six, kid you not, 6'6", six, six, he's a farmer, and he's an above knee amputee. He had a chest that started here that just never ended. And when he walked in, and all my stories have a, a, a point, folks. When he walked in, he literally walked in hiking and vaulting like this. I'm standing next to Todd. I'm looking at, I look at him, I go, there's no way we're going to help this guy. <laughs> Comes to the afternoon session, right, and I'm watching Todd work with him, and he's doing the baby steps. And as he's doing the baby steps, I'm watching him, and his shoulders are perfectly square. He's drilling it, sweating like crazy. Um, and I, I, and I kind of said to myself, <laughs> we kind of know what we're doing, I guess. <laughs> At the end of the program, what always happens in our walking schools, our full day clinics, is you become our friends. It's just the way that it is, guys. It's, it's gonna happen. So whether you like it or not, you're gonna be our friends. So in this, I'm saying goodbye to people, I'm shaking hands, and this one guy goes, you know, this has been the most incredible program ever. And then all of a sudden, this baseball glove of a hand just whacks my shoulder and, and, and hits me like this. And I turn around and it's the dude and he's wide. He's looking at me like this. He's like, it's all tennis night. This has been the best program of my life. The next time you're down in Australia, please boys come look me up and stay with me, right? Right boys, I gotta go. <laughs> and he vaulted his ass out the door. Moral of that story though, folks, bad habits die extremely hard. And I say this to you guys as professionals because he could get from point A to point B going back to the way he walked, right? So I didn't try to change him. I took him aside. I said, listen, it's fine. You, you, can, you can walk that way, but you got to set aside the time and pull yourself and rein yourself back in to practice this so that eventually you'll be able to get rid of that god-awful hike and gait that he had. Um, I, didn't say, I didn't say that to him, though. I just said, just practice, okay? <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> so 
these are all the things that you're you're looking for though is the, is the vaulting hiking and and uh, the one thing do to do to help somebody and spot them is that if you come in i just sat down gotta get back up you're the spotter <laughs> 29 years I've been with this guy. <laughs> oh, that's cute, right? <laughs> just, Not just, like that. just spot. <laughs> so when you're spotting somebody, you gotta cue them. You know, how do you get them to take more steps? You gotta stop the step from moving forward. Hand in front. We also call this slap the leg. <laughs> or, or bad leg. <laughs> bad leg, bad leg. Our goal is to get to, like I said, 12 steps. What we uh, also like to do, you ever see those like plyometric ladders you put on the floor? You roll them out. It's a perfect uh, uh, piece of equipment for this exercise because you instantly you got boxes on the floor. So you got your steps. All you have to tell a person is step both feet into the same box. So they do that and then you have, you know, do your steps on the floor. I, I used to use only masking tape. But amputees, we don't respect tape on the floor. We walk all over it. You got to have a focused goal of something, and this is a really good thing to add. And again, hand in front, helping that person, assisting them. Inside the parallel bars, down one way, turn around, come back, intermediate. You get them out of the parallel bars, whatever assisted device they got. Walker, rolling walker, forearm crutches, a cane, you start all over. Different world from inside those parallel bars to outside. You're basically going back to the beginning with each of these different exercises. Taking odd steps, different length steps. We basically put a different ladder on the floor. We have the person have these different lines. You're going to have like one through five lines on the floor. You make, you know, a couple of inches apart, whatever you want to make that kind of a grid like that. And they're just going to call out that number and hit those lines on the floor. You learn having them understand about taking a different length step. And they're going to actually speed up how you call them out. Lines again, one through five, call them in and out of order. What that translates into is now I'm in the store, I'm walking down the aisle, somebody just happens to pop up out of my way, I know exactly what I need to do to take that step because we practiced it a, a thousand times inside the parallel bars and it translates out into the community. Step up. The last one we'll do then we'll take a short break and move on to the BK. The step up exercise is something that, again, this we always preface this is that we always teach up with the good, down with the bad. Okay, that's the always the way we teach it. However, at the walking school, we do it a little bit differently. We go up with the prosthesis. And why we do that? Because this is a great strength training exercise for the extensor muscles. So we'll show you how we spot in a second. So your inside parallel bars, you take is a Reebok step, the wooden step, two inch step, it's perfect for a beginner. You're gonna start by placing the prosthesis and you might have to actually place the prosthesis for that person onto the higher height. Place it on the step, you see the knee is bent, the foot is flat, the step up the step, what does he need to do? He's gotta pull backwards. Using those extensor muscles, he pulls backwards to step up onto the step. So, actually, it's good that this video is not working because Lee in this video was doing it wrong. So, we don't want to watch this video. So, if you watch online, don't watch this one. You want to watch the next one because this is the right way. And the way you spot somebody is you're going to kneel down next to them and you got to get your hands on the prosthesis. You got to get hands on with this. One hand is on the knee cradle, one hand is on the back of the socket. You're basically pushing the cradle backwards, the socket forwards. I'm making sure Mr. Jones steps up on this step safely every single time. I'm gauging how much he's pulling backwards, firing those extensor muscles, if he's even firing at all. I'm making sure he's not jumping up with the other, other leg. He's actually using the hip on the prosthetic side. And I'm telling him to do it slowly so he really gets a good workout out of his hip. Now, he's never going to do this outside the walking school, maybe. That's okay. He's learning a lot just by doing this for three sets of five at the program. He's learning about what his hip needs to do, how strong we need to make it, 
and maybe he might be able to do this some point at home on the bottom step if he's got two handrails on one handrail on each side you never know I've seen people do a lot more than that before he goes on to this though even though he said not to watch the video you really need to watch the video because what you have to understand is this is a great, great strength training exercise that any, anybody could do their first couple of steps into their, into their home. We don't, we don't, do not, as Todd said, we do not set, have people walking up with the prosthetic side. Still continue to teach up with the good, down with the bad. You don't deviate from that at all. However, the problem that you're going to see, especially in a skilled nursing environment that we have, is a lot of these legs are going to be either weight activated, right, or a lock knee. So you got to unlock the knee, or if it's a weight-activated knee, now this is really important. You put that leg up onto the step, right? The knee is bent. So what's going to happen? Now what he's going to do is he's going to lock that leg out. You're going to help. You're going to push that back wall of the socket up, push the hydraulic knee back. You step up. Now the leg is locked. In that video that he told you not to watch, you'll see Lee step back with the prosthetic side and drop down off the step onto the prosthetic side. Right? He's strong enough to control that knee joint. But if you have somebody who's 80 years old on a weight-activated knee, right, and they go to step back, what happens when they hit that toe lever? That's when it releases, right? So every time I walk and take a step, when I shift that weight to the toe lever, it's going to break and it's going to come through. So if they were to step like this, step back, drop down two times body weight onto that knee, what's going to happen? Not only is it going to buckle, they're going to go down like a ton of bricks. You're not even going to be able to help them. So what you got to make sure is one extra step of what you got to do is you have them to start the exercise if they have a weight activated knee. If there's a step here, you have them step back just like this, hit the toe lever, it's going to break. Now the knee's bent, you put it up on the step, you're there to support the person, right? Now you say, okay, drive up. So he drives it up, now I'm in a locked position here. So now what do I want to do? Where do I go? step out onto the prosthetic side, onto the heel, right? They step down, they turn around. It's an extra step, break it, put it up, but it keeps our folks safe. You got to keep our folks safe. That's very, very important. So we try to bring real life into the mix. So now these exercises taking it to another level, practicing going up a curb. That's what the picture on the left is. Picture on the right. We use balance pads. I love to use different surfaces that the person has to practice the exercises on. You got to get used to different surfaces because that's what real life is. Not everything is flat ground. You have to practice different things. Some people will just avoid those areas. They never walk on grass again. Or they never walk on, you know, never go to the beach again. So they have to practice these things. So you try to do the best you can in the environment we got. And then we practice stepping on and stepping over the step. Just learning to do things, again, more strengthening exercises. The one exercise that we start to do, though, which is a great one we call power walk, walking against resistance. This is great for amputees. This is great for stroke patients, neuro patients. You basically take a TheraBand. You're going to wrap it around a person's residual limb. You as a spotter, like I am, I'm standing behind. I got a long band so that I can, it's long enough that I can stand up behind, give him good resistance. I can watch his shoulders. I can watch his knee. And all he has to do is walk against the resistance of the band. Because you're placing it above the knee joint, right at the end of the socket, but above the knee joint, what it forces him to do is he has to bend his knee. There's really no way to do this exercise unless the resistance is way too high without bending your knee. So now you do that back and forth a couple of times, you take that band off, now the leg feels really light. It's, it's, you have a lot, lot of control. It's a really smooth walking gait just by adding a simple band. And TheraBand actually just released some bands, the CLX bands. They're like these loops attached to each other, which is perfect for this exercise because you actually have handles now built into the band. Now, you don't need the handles, but, you know, for the extra 20 bucks, get them. <laughs> Does um, anyone have any questions on any of the AK stuff, any uh, Todd stuff? All right, I'm going to reiterate this to you guys, is that unfortunately when this was downloaded to this, uh, the, the uh, videos didn't transfer. So that's why it all looked like slides, but pretty much 80% of this is all video. So you can go to amputeewalkingschool.com and you can click to our education section 
and then there is the series. It's actual. It's an actual course, online course. So in order to get it, you have to hit buy, right? Buy. <laughs> and then when you hit buy, you don't have to pay the money. You just got to put in the code, and it'll give you access to the. But I like the word buy. <laughs> but what do you got to put in for that code? So. <laughs> <no>. <laughs> buy now. So you got to. Go through, you hit to e-learning, you go to the course, you hit buy, and you type in the code AWS course 2016. All lowercase, all together, AWS course 2016, and then it'll come up for free. There's also an app on iTunes and Google. It has all the courses are on the app. And this is, I made the app up because the therapist wanted the training at their fingertips. So we're trying this out to see if it works. I've gotten a lot of good feedback from it. Um, but it's basically everything you're seeing as far as the videos, the sets, and all the instruction of each of the different exercises is on there too. The app is called Amputee Walking School. And it's $1.99. Yeah, it, 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 you got, it costs money to make an app. <laughs> so. We try to keep it as, as uh, inexpensive as we can. It's a dollar ninety nine. <laughs> you know, a dollar ninety nine. It's. I was like, what should we do? And I, and I've learned a very big lesson. Ninety nine cents versus a dollar ninety nine is a very big thing. <laughs> you know, ninety nine cents is like, ah, oh, it's just ninety nine cents. A dollar ninety nine. I get tons of emails. Well, what do you get for a dollar ninety nine? So now you got a preview of what you're going to get. <laughs> what do you get for $1.99? <laughs> you can buy a cup of coffee for $1.99, or you can see us every day on your phone. All right. Is there another question? Um, I'm a nurse, I'm not a PT, so I'm not really familiar with the credits. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Are you going to touch on that later? So uh, Dennis is below the knee, I'm above the knee, so I have a, a, a knee joint, a microprocessor knee. A computerized knee. Yep. And the way... Don't, don't feel bad. Most people don't. It's, it's the technology exploded in just the last 10 years. You know, unfortunately, the byproduct of war is technology advancements. So um, it's hard to keep... We can't even keep up with it half the time. So don't even worry about it. All you need to worry about is just keep doing what you're doing as a nurse and loving the way you do what you do because we love you for what you do. Uh, in fact, it was my nurse that really had me have this amputation. They were going to do a limb salvage, and they were going to fuse my bones in my ankle. And she actually went and spoke to my family about it and said, you'd be better off having a below-the-knee amputation because he'd probably walk with a noticeable limp the rest of his life and be in pain. And if he had the amputation, he's going to get up on a prosthesis. Thank God for Antoinette. I don't know her last name, but I just remember her first name. Because not only did I have the amputation, run faster than 98% of the people out. Well, not anymore, but, you know when I did back in the day. So I love you for what you do. <laughs> well, it's true. I love all you guys for what you do. We're in this incredible healthcare field that just changes lives all the time. All right, below the knee, this is all, this is, uh, my, all my great stuff I did. Look how, that was a world record jump. Look at how great I was, look. <laughs> four, four world records, you know, gold medals, so, you know. How long you want to look at that for? <laughs> that was 18 feet 10. Yeah. You want to hear a funny story about that? Real quick, I'll tell you a really funny story. So they used that photo two years later at the 1990 World Championships, right? So it was on every bus stop, right? So I come to Germany, to Berlin, and there I am on every bus stop. I was like, take another picture, take another picture. <laughs> so we, we come back from the World Championships. A couple weeks later, I get this phone call, and this guy gets on the phone and goes, hello, is this Mr. Ola? I'm like, uh, yeah. He goes, well, I work for German BA, and we're doing a commercial, and we want to highlight some Paralympic athletes. And then he goes like this, he goes, we would like to film you in Berlin running down the street. Would you like to do that for us? And I'm like, yeah, all right. Yeah, I could, I could get into that. So he goes like this, he goes, but I have one question. Can I paint you gold? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what? And they're going to pay me, right? So I'm like, yeah, I guess you can paint me gold. I guess that would be all right. And then he goes like this. He goes, but one other question I need to know. You can't really see too close on that. But he goes like this. He goes, 
are you very hairy? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I kind of am. And he goes, would you mind if we shave you? <laughs> and I'm like, no, dude, you're not shaving me. You can paint me gold, and that's as far as I'm going. So I went over and did it. Actually, it came out a really good commercial. It's pretty funny. Anyway. <laughs> it cost another thousand to shave. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So that was my history. So that was really great. You can look it up online. Go to YouTube. You can see all our videos. It's all good. This is a. This is also history. You can see it on a, a website. That was my race from 1990. Just keep in mind, it was the 90s, so it was bowl haircuts and short shorts when you see it. Okay. But so. it was. It's when you see the race, though. It was really. It was the first time for disabled sports that it was actually featured as a true event on TV. This is over in, in uh, Great Britain. So we had announcers, you had these, you know, the, a true event uh, for, the, for the sport. And uh, it was never done before. So it really was a game changer for that, having an announcer and, and everything, all the setup for it. Uh, we talk about contractions. It's, it's a difficult thing for you guys. I mean, what's so difficult about it is, um, you have these folks that are been down for a long time with non-healing wounds on their feet, so they're not in weight bearing for all these months, and you know they're contracted even before they come to us at the skilled level. So you know the the only thing I can say is as best you can just to try to work those contractures out. But I feel for you guys because what winds up happening is we at our facilities it happens. I mean you you may get one or two degrees, you're all excited. They go back to the room, and what happens? They come back down, it's right back again, right? So it's, it's a difficult thing to, to, to do and to really get these folks to cognitively, for a lot of them, understand that they got to work on keeping that leg straight and making sure they don't have any, any pressure on that residual limb on that suture line because, you know, being non-sensate, it could really, you know, cause problems. So it, it is a problem. So these are all um, the muscle groups that we work and, and getting folks up and going. And I, I say this all the time, and I'll say it to you guys. Um, if all we have is just the below the knee amputation and the structure of our knee is sound, your ligaments, tendons, and everything else in your knee, and there's no other comorbidities going on, I'm a lot better off than somebody who goes downhill skiing and blows out their knee. I'm better off as a below the knee amputate. Not a lot of difference in how we rehab somebody with a below the knee amputation you kind of do the same things that you would do for knee injuries like that. What do you got to do? You got to strengthen everything around it, right? Same thing for below the knee amputees. However, we do need to do things slightly differently um, as far as what activities we do with them in order to make sure that we keep the residual limb away from trauma. And it's subtle things that we have to do, but you really do need to be aware of it. So the core exercise that we talk about with our folks, especially our older folks, is to get them to go home and do squats. That's the greatest exercise you could do for all of us, but especially for below the knee amputees. But we have to do them differently. And in these slides, we'll, uh, we'll show you is that the problem that we have um, for below the knee amputees, with any exercise you do for below the knee amputees, one thing you cannot deviate from is whatever it is, whether it's, you know, doing free type standing exercises or anything with um, any resistant training, you have to make sure that on the prosthetic side, the heel maintains contact with the floor or whatever piece of equipment you're using. And why we say that is because you deviate from that. You got to understand how that socket fits, right? We're loading soft tissue, we're offloading bone, right? When you make a leg. So in offloading that bone, you don't want to have any bone on a hard socket, right? So what happens is if I was to do a squat, traditionally how you guys would do a squat, the problem that I have is as I start going down, what happens? The heel rises on that prosthetic side right about here. I'm only going down a couple of degrees, but it changes the angle of the socket and what's happening inside that socket. When I'm inside that socket, my bones are straight up and down inside that socket, right? Now, where's my tibia and fibula? It's anterior. I'm being drilled into the front wall of that socket, and this hurts. The further you go down, it feels like your tibia bone wants to snap right off. So you got to make sure that no matter what exercise we do, that heel stays in contact with the floor or with the piece of equipment that you're using. 
So there's two different ways, three different ways that we actually do squats. We do wall slides, right? So how we do it correctly is you have the person back up to the wall, slide a stool underneath them before they put their back against the wall because we want to keep our residents safe. This is more advanced. Somebody who's 46, 47, yes, do this exercise with. Somebody who's in their 80s, to get them in that position is kind of difficult. So you don't even want to do that. So what I do now is in the second slide, I step out onto the prosthetic side first, right, at heel contact. The heel and the socket is still straight up and down, right? Then I match my sound side to it. And then as I slide down the wall, if you look at the angle of the socket, right, still straight up and down. So where's my tibia and fibula? Still straight up and down inside that socket, not being drilled against the front wall. So Todd and I used to have competitions when we would do this. We'd s sit next to each other, and after like three or four minutes, your quads start going like this. You know, and then after a while, you can't hold it anymore. You just sit right back down. But in his day, he would always beat me because he had a 36-inch quad when he was competing. Oh, they are working. Hey, these videos work. <laughs> so you step out. See that, Todd? All your videos probably worked. You didn't try it. No, I clicked on them. The most common way, and we send people home to do their squats at the kitchen sink. You know, we re reiterate that, and I really have to reiterate that all the time to these folks. You don't do it at the bathroom sink. Why? We had somebody pull it off the wall one time, and the wife got really, really upset. Came back to the walk-in school. She was really upset. I said, listen, I told him to, at the kitchen sink, not the bathroom sink. But he, he was so motivated because of the walk-in school and the, and the relationship of all the folks that he realized he was going to be able to get his life back when he saw everyone doing this. And he took it to heart where every three days a week he was doing his squats, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And um, this one day he just got really excited. He, he got up and he started brushing his teeth. And he said, I'll just get these squats over. And he pulled the sink off the wall. She came in. She was so furious. Four weeks later, she came in. She was so happy because <laughs> she got the bathroom redone. True story. So the two common mistakes that folks make is to the right, instead of what I do is always with safety in mind, put a chair behind these folks, right? Always with safety in mind. And what I have them do is I want them to fully extend their arms out, just like that, so that they keep their back nice and straight. Common mistakes are is they go like this, and they bend down. They go down into this position, the heel rises, tibia comes forward. Or I say, no, I want you to go as if you're going to sit back into the chair, and they go like this, and they never bend the knees. So what we're looking for, so those are the two common mistakes that we see. So what I'm looking for, this is what I'm looking for, is the angles that I want, right? Arms nice and straight, back nice and straight, looking straight ahead. Somebody who's 80 years old, you don't have to get them into that position. You don't got to get them down to 90 degrees. All they have to do is just engage the quads. So if you just get them to bend their knees like this, what's going on? They're firing their quads, they're firing their extensors, their, their glute muscles. And then, though, what I have them do is when they come to the top of the movement, make sure they don't go like this and lock their knees. Because if you lock your knees, what's going to happen? You take all the resistance off your quads. So what I have them do is I'll have them go down like this, come up to the top, go right back down. So the whole time, I am, I am having resistance on the muscle groups the entire time as I take them through these exercises. A beginner, you only do three sets of five with a two-second hold at the bottom, though. One 1,000, two 1,000. Back up, right back down. Ultimately, we want to get to at least 15 to 20 squats within, you know, three sets to five sets is what we're looking for. For intermediate, it's a four-second hold. Advanced is a six-second hold. This is Rod. Rod is, without question, guys, my most favorite person in the entire world. I will tell you that Rod Harris is a type 1 diabetic. He's blind in one eye. He's a below the knee amputee on one side. He's a transmed on the other side. He had a kidney transplant, quadruple bypass, digits off his fingers. He's 43 years old. And every single time you meet this guy and talk to this guy, he's smiling and laughing. Every single day. 
Rod Harris goes out of his way to get people to the walking school. He'll go up to people in the mall that he sees who are amputees and abducts them <laughs> and takes them to the program. But <laughs> this man, every single day of his life, I've never met anybody like this man in my life. 20,000 amputees that I've had, I've learned more about life from this guy than anyone I've ever learned in my life. He knows what it is to not sweat the small stuff in life. He knows, he lives it, he breathes it. So much so, Rod gave me a call. He never missed the walking school. He'd come to every walking school we ever did. One day he didn't come, and I immediately got really, really upset and afraid. The very next day he calls me, he goes, Dennis. I'm like, Rod, oh, God. I goes, what's going on with you? Where are you? He goes, well, you're not going to believe this one. I'm like, what, Rod? He goes, well, I was rushed to Long Island Jewish, and they airlifted me to Westchester Medical Center. They want to do a heart transplant and a pancreas transplant. And he's laughing on the phone. I just went like this. I said, Rod, I love you so much, man. And he's laughing. He goes, don't worry, Dennis. I'll be back soon. Very next day, I get a phone call. Dennis, you're not going to believe this one. I'm like, what's going on now? He goes, well... My heart's at 50 percent, so they're not going to do the heart transplant. So now what they want to do is they're going to do a triple bypass and a valve replacement before they do the pancreas transplant. And he's laughing. He goes, I'll see you in eight weeks. He's back at the walking school. If there's only one thing, guys, you take away from this program, forget about all the training. Like I said, he lives and loves every single day like he can and would be his last day on the face of this planet. We got to all just stop sweating the small stuff because that's all what it is. Because you could be gone tomorrow. That's what I learned from this man. And I embrace him. We were just with him yesterday. I embrace him every single day, the way he lives and loves. And he's an example for all our amputees that, that he, we put him in contact with. I put him in contact with every type 1 diabetic I meet. He's just that kind of guy. Okay, you can all go home now. <laughs> <laughs> so Rod was great, too, because Rod did a lot of things wrong. You know, so if you don't have, you know, the kitchen sink, we do it the parallel bars. There's been plenty of places that we've seen where people don't even have parallel bars. So if they don't have parallel bars, we do programs where there aren't parallel bars, so you've got to actually get creative. And what I did with Rod was body-assisted squats. So I just took his cane, I propped up the wheelchair against the wall, and in the first video, you see he'll, he's doing a slightly wrong. See the way he's bending his arms? He's riding up on his, on his toe a little bit. So I, then I had him fully extend his arms and then go back into that squat position. Set it two seconds, come back up, and then right back down. Rod, go, guys. Rod was very interesting when he came to us. He had the worst Trendelenburg gait you ever did see, right? So every time he stepped out onto his prosthetic side, he had no hip strength to hold himself. So every time he stepped out, this is what he looked like when he first came to us. So much so that his kids called him Penguin. <laughs> nice kids, right? It took us months strengthening his hips to get him to where he has a slight glitch, but you wouldn't even notice it. And it's really, truly amazing, his commitment to trying to get himself to a point of getting his strength back. Um, I did learn something when I was down in Kentucky, though, a way you can help somebody that has a Trendelenburg gait. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this came from Kentucky. I didn't make it up. All I'm doing is playing it forward, okay? And so we were down in Kentucky. We had a break. One of the therapists came over and said, you know, I, I have a great technique that I do for people who have Trendelenburg gait. I was like, well, what is it? He goes, well, what I have them do is I have them step out. When they step out onto that prosthetic side, I don't let them drop in. What I want them to do is just kind of push that hip out and try to hold that hip out as they come through gait. So every time they come through, I have them go like this. I said, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. He goes like this. He goes, well, I have them sachet. I'm like, what do you mean? Kentucky. I'm just telling you, Kentucky. So he goes, this is what I do. I make them sachet. So every time they walk, they have to do sachet. So they go like this. <laughs> this is all for you guys, okay? I didn't make it up. It's Kentucky. <laughs> I do it pretty good, though, right? You would win a contest. <laughs> Loop band training. I discovered these about 12, 13 years ago. I was in a gym and I was watching these guys 
uh, using loop bands and actually uh, doing squats. And I was like, wow, that would be awesome for our amputees. If they did this, they could strengthen the hip. So I did some research, and I found that TheraBand, what I like about the loop bands, as opposed to just tying the TheraBand, is it gives you consistent resistance through the rainbow. So yellow, red, green, and blue on the loop band side. Uh, but they were expensive because it was TheraBand. I did some more research, found another company. It's called um, Stretchwell. And they come in packs of 10. And they have an extra color. So it's orange, red, yellow, green, blue is what they have. And so you can actually give your clients a band to go home, and they can actually do this with their spouse at home. So um, we started incorporating the loop bands and working with our clients with, with the loop bands. And where do we put it? When we put it onto the person's residual limb, it goes onto the prosthetic side midway through the, through the prosthesis and then put it onto their contralateral side. Uh, if they're a small BK, you want to put it up right at the condyles. If they're very deconditioned and are having problems stretching the band there, then move it up to the thighs. Um, one thing I will add, though, in, in, in these, using these, these loop bands, you always got to make sure that you ask the patients if they had any history of any lower back pain. Because you choose the wrong band, trust me, you can really hurt somebody. Because that, it just everything lights up when you do these ba band exercises. And Rod, as I have him doing this here, he's just sidestepping. This is a beginner. But he's slightly doing it wrong. He's kind of dragging his foot. What we're looking for, when you put somebody in these bands, the first time they do this, they'll take a step. So this is what I want. A big step, slightly bend your knees, you're engaging your quads. Then what I want you to do is to pick up the trail leg Move it halfway, but hold the resistance. What everybody does the first time is they all go like this. The leg flies over, band falls down around their feet. Or what they'll do is they'll drag the leg over. What I want them to do is I want to take that big step, pick it up, hold the resistance, put it down halfway so the band stays taut around the person's leg. Big step, and then halfway, just like this. You can do this with somebody with a walker. You may need a two assist. And so I had Rod, I'm spotting him around his back. So what I have the person do is the way you have to do this, I'm inside the walker here. And what I do is I take a big step first. And now what you want to do is the furthest point of the walker, you want to move midline to the person's body. So then you move that furthest point right here. And now when I go to do my, my half a step, I'm back in the center. So it's big step, move the walker, then your next step. The problem that a lot of these folks have is they're still deconditioned, so you may have to have that second assist to help them move the walker. But great exercise. What's that? As long as you got support. Yep. Um, Make it easier to roll it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's the one one thing about this uh, slide, which I which I added, was that the one thing that we see a lot is that when we're doing these exercises up to this point, we always ask the person have the toes facing forward. Amputees love to rotate out their hips, and that's what they do a lot with these exercises up until this point. So you have to really focus and stress toes facing forward, and that for some people is an exercise in itself, just to keep those toes and those everything facing forward. So you might have to remind them of that uh, when we go through this. And then we add on a squat, which is again, not for someone that's gonna be at our facilities, uh, but people that come to the walking school to get up to this point. That's your cue. You just said it. You just told them. You see the squat. They're doing a squat. <laughs> I thought you wanted you to want, add you something. Want me, if you want me to do it, I'll, I'll talk. You no, no, it. no. We're done with this one now. <laughs> now. <laughs> this, all right. We'll go back to the squat. So in doing the squat, you want to make sure you turn the toes out, okay? Because, again, if I was to do a squat like this, and then I try to go down, what's going to happen? The heel comes up. If I turn out the toes, I go into the second position of ballet or into that sumo position here. And now when I drop down, the heel stays in contact, right? 
So, but this is advanced. You're not going to put somebody 75. We never put somebody at our facilities in this position because it's just too difficult for them to. But when you do this, you come out of it, you're engaged in everything. So I'm hitting my adductor muscles to start the movement, then everything I'm working. So it's a great exercise that we do with younger, younger folks. This is an advanced exercise. Um, this, I, we use this all the time, not only to teach people to go up steps, but it's a great strength training exercise, and I also work on balance with this, and I also work on stretching with this. So if you look at these the, the different steps here, this would be a beginner, this would be advanced. This step, as you see in this photo here, I use just to stretch the hip flexors on the, on the opposite side. So I have them step up and I have them progress their hips forward and they get a really nice stretch on that prosthetic side in the hip flexor muscles. Uh, on this though, for strength training, what I have the person do is I'll have the person lift their leg. So they're holding on with two hands, they lift. Now I engage my quads and my hip flexor. Then I have them put it on that first step. They got to drive themselves up to the step then come back down, lift, and bring it back down. Great strength training exercise, great for balance, because they have the person go to a point of holding on with just one hand. So they got to work on both sides. If you're going to work the, the sound side in doing this exercise, though, you got to be really careful. Why? If the person is very deconditioned, you got to be really careful. Now I'm asking you from here, I want you to lift your sound side up to that first step or that second step. You have to be able to bend your knees slightly, just like this, to engage your quads, to stabilize yourself here. If you don't have the strength in your quad and your hamstring right now, what's going to happen is if I go to lift my leg, this leg flies back into hyperextension. So you got to be careful. If they're not strong enough, bypass bringing their sound side up because you don't want to hurt anyone. This is another guy that I love, Al. Al was, uh, t he's the typical guy we work with. He, uh, I mentored him in the hospital uh, right before his amputation, but because being a slow healer, he was healing for a very long time. He only got 10 days of rehab because he was healing the whole time. Kept coming to the walker. He could not, he was so deconditioned, he could not pull himself up out of a chair. Um, but months and months of training, and his goal was to be able to actually go into his house and get rid of the, the, um, the ramp and he had to walk up two steps. The first time we did this, there's amputees sitting over at the side. He was shot after just one time of doing this, but continuing to train and doing his squats at home, he got to that point where he was able to get rid of the ramp and, uh, and ambulate into the house. It was great. Awesome. The power walk we do uh, also with below the knee amputees to work the hip flexors, quads, um, and this was great. I mean, Rod, think about this. BK amputee on one side, transmit on the other side. Talk about balance issues. You know, and again, Rod, when he first came to us, could hardly do any of this stuff. And I did one leg, and then Todd was like, well, after you do that, why don't you try both? And then we had him pulling both bands, and uh, it was amazing. He's um, back living life again. Awesome stuff. All right. Yeah, you do one side, then you add a second band like we have here. You can do this for uh, above the amputees too. Well, I started using two bands, working with Mario, bilateral. So it, it's a great exercise when you have two bands on. All right. Um, there's a couple more exercises that you can see online. Does anyone have any questions at all? You want to come back up? Is that? Again, AWS, what is it again? AWS? Uh, AWS Course 2016. And you can see a lot more of this stuff and get to see my great race, how great I am. And wonderful. <laughs> All right, like gentlemen, that was, uh, that was amazing. Thanks. I think uh, get a round of applause for these guys now. They absolutely deserve it. I'd like to bring up at this point uh, Effie Carney, who's the administrator of the Phoenix Rehabilitation and Nursing Center, uh, to say a few words about the Phoenix. Thanks, Effie. Wow. Todd Dennis, this is not the first time I've heard the presentation. It's not the second time. It's probably not even the third time. Every time I hear it, I'm, I'm drawn in, I'm inspired. 
get even a little choked up, especially hearing some of those stories and the appreciation of life that each one of these tremendous people have. So once again, thank you, Todd. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Another round of applause for them. Thank you. Um, it's really, I'm very proud of this association with the walking school. We've successfully brought in already a handful of patients in the last uh, half a year, whatever it is that we've had the program. Um, and we thank you all for coming, the, you from the hospital, the community, the therapists, uh, the case managers. We really appreciate you coming down tonight to hear the presentation, whether you've sent patients to us part of this program, whether you've even seen the presentation in the past. Thank you once again for coming tonight. Um, I would thank you, Queen Anya Ira, for putting this together. And thank you, Ashley, for really spearheading the entire event. A lot of hard work went into it. Uh, you see, it was not easy to pull this together. I don't know if Ashley is here, but thank you. Oh, there you are. And Mallory as well. And I think Kyle's here too. Uh, ownership and administra upper administration left, but I'm going to thank them for coming tonight to show their support. A little bit about the Phoenix, uh, just for those of you that may be somewhat familiar, but not fully familiar, we are a 400 bed skilled nursing facility in downtown Brooklyn, right across the street from Brooklyn Hospital, uh, two miles, three miles from New York Presbyterian, and maybe five miles, maybe no, less than five miles from Methodist, maybe four, three miles. So we are close, very close to all those hospitals, easily, easy to get to by public transportation, easy to get to by car. We do have valet service during the week when their parking is limited. That is free for new admissions. We have a shuttle that picks up families as well that runs seven days a week. They will pick you up from your house and drop you off. So there's no issue with transportation for all those big three hospitals. I think those are the hospitals that are represented here tonight primarily. And Lutheran, oh, there is, I met somebody from Lutheran, there you are, where is she? Right there. No, there you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah Lutheran. You. <laughs> On the other side too, yeah. Uh, so, uh, we really, we welcome all these families to come. We really, we're, we, a lot of customer service. We have a concierge program. We have the amputee program. I, we are a five-star CMS rated facility for three years straight. Um, there's real, and I think Methodist even told me that there's different tiers. There's tier one, tier two, tier three. And in the Presbyterian system, we are number one. And we are very proud of that. And, um, and we're actually invited to meet with their orthopedic program as well very shortly. So this partnership, our overall ratings for quality, being tier one, we're very proud. We're proud to be number one in Brooklyn, number one in all the boroughs. And that's all you need to know about the Phoenix for now. <laughs> Just leave it at that. All right, so this is your last chance. Uh, any questions you might have thought of throughout the night? Uh, these gentlemen shared a lot of expertise uh, with you throughout the evening. So anything you have to ask about their presentations, about the Phoenix, uh, these three gentlemen are, are here to take your questions. Do you want to touch on our demographics? Oh, sure. <laughs> sure, I, I, most people know, but I'll, I'll reiterate. Um, we are the largest healthcare provider to the Chinese population, certainly in New York, and I was told even in the country. As a 400 bed facility, 65% Chinese means we're about 230, 240 Chinese people in the building uh, today. And it's been that way for 40 years since the building opened up. Um, when the building opened, for, sorry, excuse me, when the building opened up 40 years ago, there was no facility near Chinatown in downtown Manhattan. And the Department of Health said, well, we'll let you open the building, but you have to really cater towards the Chinese. So from day one, they were the original uh, nursing home that catered towards the Chinese. We have Mandarin, Cantonese, Fukinese. I think there's seven different dialects within the building. Um, we have other cultures as well, but that's our um, hallmark. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. What do they prefer? Yeah, so, you know, when we refer to the residual name, do you call it the residual name or is there another? Oh, that's oh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a, I'll, I had somebody ask me that like 10 years ago. And I just said, well, my little buddy. <laughs> remember, remember that? <laughs> residual limb is what we use all the time. Yeah. Stump, stump is a old terminology. You know, so residual limb, 
you know, is probably the most widely accepted, I guess. But the semantics are, are what they are, and, you know, I think you just got to care for people the way they deserve to be cared for, and it all falls into place, you know. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. So how do you deal with phantom limb pain when people, do they still have this when they come oh, yeah. to see you at times? Yeah. Because there's a lot of things that I've been reading about, some um, yeah. new procedures on trying to, um, you know, lessen that. So yeah, how do you there's, deal with that? There's a lot that's being done, actually. Uh, nerve relocation. Because a lot of times, you know, the, the problems with phantom pain is, you know, they, they pull that nerve ending down, they clip it, and they put it back up into soft tissue. So if it's too far close to the skin, you get more issues with that. As far as phantom limb is concerned, uh, you know, trauma as opposed to vascular, you know, you get things lit up in there. And for the most part, there's not a clear answer to that because everybody's different. But generally speaking, I, I had really bad phantom limb pain. Uh, you have phantom limb pain and phantom sensation where you feel it itching in specific areas of the foot. And so once you get into a leg, it generally starts to subside. Um, but then again, you know, you come across people that unfortunately have real severe problems with it. Um, there's not a clear answer to it, to be honest with you. Yeah. Pretty much everyone is an individual concerning that yeah. type of thing that's going yeah. on. I right. mean, even to this day, if I do too much... I'll be sitting at home, you know, after I get my leg off, and then all of a sudden it'll be like a lightning bolt of somebody taking a fork and sticking it in my big toe that isn't there anymore. It's just you jump, but then it eventually subsides. So everybody's different. Not a clear-cut answer to it. Thank you. <laughs> you like that. <laughs> all right. Anyone else going once? Well, folks, you know, I want to thank all of you for, for coming out tonight. Uh, know that we're here for you guys and uh, for your patience and like I said, your 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 Yira and um, and um, Queena. I know I'm getting there. I'm tired. I'm tired. I know who Queena is. Queena Sheba. So um, if you do have someone that uh, needs to be chatted with after amputation or even before amputation, give them a call. They know the program well, and you know we'll get the information to them about who we are and what we do. And, any way we can help you guys, we're here for you. I have one question. Somebody asked me during the break, and maybe you can answer it. Maybe they're a little shy to ask. They were asking in the hospital if you would make a hospital visit, somebody has a surgery or a hospital episode, even if they're not coming to the nursing home, what kind of support can you do for them? Yeah, we absolutely can. Um, it just the term depends on how, when we're asked, because, again, we're all over the country. So we're four days here in the New York area working with our facilities in New York. But at a minimum, I can get on the phone. And that's, like, that's why I had that document put together that, th that you all have that describes who we are, what we do, and what that whole protocol is. So like I said, I'm, I'm talking with amputees every day on the phone uh, all yeah, over the country. And, so. and if we can't you know, physically be there, like Quina is here, uh, Yair is here to help us to, they're kind of an extension of who we are in a way. Um, well, we just had that happen just recently, just two days ago. Todd got on the phone with what was, you can't say the guy's last name because it's against the hippopotamus rules. Yeah. So. <laughs> but we have, we have patients that contact us in various ways. It's not even just for the patients, sometimes even for the family members. The family members are looking for help and looking for answers and they, they don't know which way to turn. So, you know, they might need help and we can help them and be of assistance to them as well. Um, over the phone is great. If we could do it in person, it's much better. Again, seeing is believing. We say that all the time. So if we can help, reach out to us. You know, if you reach out to us, we can help. I could give you one last example of how important that document is. We were in Ohio because uh, we also have a, a facility in Youngstown, Ohio. And so we were only there one day a month in Youngstown. We went in. We ran the program. We run the walking school there. The very next day, and we also do education, so we're out educating all the different healthcare systems. The very next day, two patients were sent to the facility, the day after we left. 
It was great because the concierge at that facility, as well as the um, physical therapist and our liaisons, did an excellent job of talking about who Dennis and Todd are, gave them the information, they read about us, they went to our website, they saw all the videos. So the next month we came back and we went in to see them because they're at our facility, still at the facility, you would have thought we were rock stars. They're like, oh my God, you're the guys on that video. That's you guys right there and you're right here right now. Oh my God, this is so great. And it was, you know, it was amazing. You know, two months later, she was fit with a leg. We got her up. They, they ran a piece on the news about it. It was just incredible. It was just absolutely amazing. It went off seamlessly. So we're supporting the folks, even though we're not there, but once a month. They're still part. It's like an amputee support group each month, right? So you have all these different support groups that meet once a month. And that's kind of what we, what we have going on, support group slash training. Well, it's incredible to think of all the people you've helped over the years and all the, the more people you'll help, you know, through all the folks who came out here tonight. So yeah, on you. behalf of uh, CBS Radio New York, uh, thank you for coming out to the Adorama Live Theater. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Alex Silverman, and uh, we'll be around. We appreciate it. Thanks, Alex. Thank you.